Hello, thank you for joining us today here on the Motor City Church YouTube channel. We're so excited to connect with you and to bring you life-giving, hope-filled messages. I encourage you, take just a moment, hit that subscribe button. Go ahead, hit the subscribe button. Also, make sure that you like this video and we'd love to hear how it's helped you. Please do that and we look forward to connecting with you more and more right here at Motor City Church. Today's message, I believe, is going to be a great encouragement to you and your life. Wow, you guys are so gracious, so gracious. Um, Louisville, love you so much. Excited to be with you today as well. And um, man, this, this is incredible. I've been hearing for so long what God's doing here. And to, to come in and see um, how quickly campuses are coming up and, and building updates and, and how uh, you're just, I mean, this is July 4th weekend and this room is full and, uh, and Louisville's full. I mean, it's amazing. You really are growing in the summer. And um, I, I just want to say this, God has blessed me to be able to travel a good bit. Uh, it's an incredible privilege to go to different churches. Can I just say this to you and will you just trust me on it? What God's doing here. He's not doing everywhere. And so don't treat this as common. You're in, you're in something very special. And I want you to get all in. If you're, you're hanging on the fringe, you need to, to move in the family deeper because what God is doing here is remarkable. And um, it is an honor to be here today. And I just want to take a minute to honor your pastor, uh, Dr. Dave Martin. Um, Dr. Dave is a dear friend, and we do look alike. And, uh, you know, we... we just laugh together and all that. But let me just say this. When I started pastoring about 10 years ago, and um, he has had a worldwide ministry for decades, and I remember that he treated me when I was uh, really unknown, nobody knew me, nobody's inviting me anywhere. He treated me um, with incredible love, care, invested in me. And I can say this with all honesty. Um, I wouldn't be where I am this book wouldn't exist without your investment in me. And so, Dr. Dave, I just honor you today. Thank you. I realize, um, I realize that you make everybody's world larger and larger. And I'm just honored to be connected to you. I love you with all my heart. And um, so I'm honored to be with you today. I want you to get your Bible, and I want you to turn to the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel chapter 28, 1 Samuel 28, and um, while you're doing that, you just saw a picture of my family, and I uh, wish they were here today. You may have noticed we have five kids. Um, usually people, when I show that picture, you kind of get a mixture between excitement and concern from the crowd when we have that many children, and, and I know what you're thinking uh, when you saw that picture. I, I, I do. I know what you're thinking. I look good for having five kids, don't I? I just, uh, you know, some people are like, well, you must love kids. Like, no, I love my wife. That's why we've got so many kids. I The kids were just a byproduct of my love for her. But uh, I do wish they were here today. And, um, and, and, and I am excited for this brand new series, Book Club. This is my first book. Um, and so it's an honor to be here to share it with you. It's called Hope After Church Hurt, uh, Dr. Dave mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, this book uh, is God's answer to a crisis we have been in for some time. Um, even just in the last few weeks, your news feed has shown uh, moral failures and people who have been hurt by church. Uh, for decades, this is something that we've needed an answer to, and I feel like God's given us a practical guide filled with my personal stories, but l this is the most important part, a positive tone. How many of you just believe God still wants to use the church, right? And how many of you believe he wants to heal people? Right, so this is that book. It's God's answer to using, healing his church and healing people. So here's what I realize. You today may be sitting here, and though you're in church, you may have some hurt for, that's happened uh, among church people or at a former church. I realize that. This book's for you. But I also want to say this. Every single one of you knows someone who used to come to church but doesn't anymore because of something that happened in the church. So here's my challenge to you. Even though you may be whole, why don't you be someone else's miracle and buy this book for them and help them in their healing journey? I think um, today, here's the churches God's using, those who reach the lost and heal the found. 
And so what I'm, I'm going to ask you to do is be a church who doesn't just reach the lost. You are, but I want you to make an effort today to heal the found and to help someone. This could be a bridge to them recovering. I, I only have a few copies that are here. You can go on Amazon and get it. I think after this service, I'm going to sign. Uh, and when all the books are gone, all the books are gone, and you'll be rewarded because you came to 930 instead of 1130. Sound good? All right. All right. So um, I'm going to preach from the book today a message that is very dear and personal to me. Um, one of my traditions in the summer, I love this. I love to go to the movies. How many of you love going to the movies? I still love it. I, I love the popcorn. I love getting there early. I love the previews. And I like just about any type of genre, whether that's animation, uh, whether that's uh, you know action, e- even romantic comedies I can get on. The only one that I, I just personally don't care for is that I've just never been a person who loves horror movies. It's just never been my favorite. I know some of you, you love them. It's just not mine. Um, as a matter of fact, we were in Disney World a few years ago and I was with my son. He was about five years old and we were riding the Haunted Mansion, which is just this, this little cartoonish ride through a Haunted Mansion. I mean, this is the most innocent way to present ghosts and he's laughing and excited and I'm, I'm calling Ghostbusters. I'm pleading the blood. I'm, I'm binding and, and I just, I, there's just something in me that believes once something has died, it should remain dead. So today I want to talk to you from a message called Haunted by Hurt. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 5. When Saul the king saw the Philistine army, he was afraid, and terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. Saul then said to his attendants, find me a woman who is a medium, or maybe your translation would say a witch, so I may go and inquire of her. There's one in Endor, they said. So the king disguised himself, putting on other clothes. And at night, he and two men went to the woman and he said, Consult a spirit for me and bring up for me one I name. But the woman said to him, Surely you know uh, what Saul has done. He has cut off the mediums and spiritualists in the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? The king, who was in disguise, swore to her by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. Well, the woman asked, whom shall I bring up for you? Bring up the old prophet Samuel, he said. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out to the top of her lungs um, and said to Saul, why do you deceive me? You're the king, Saul. And the king said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said, I see a ghostly figure coming up out of the earth. What does he look like? He asked. An old man wearing a prophet's robe is coming up. And she said, and then Saul knew it was the old prophet Samuel. Would you um, bow your heads, even in Louisville, will you bow your heads? I want to pray and invite the Holy Spirit to do a work in each of our hearts. Father, we pray today that you would turn uh, this campus, the kitchens and living rooms and dining rooms that people are sitting in all across the world, and Louisville, we pray right now, would become an operating room for your Holy Spirit. And may any pain, any wounds that remain in a soul may be healed and whole in Jesus' name. Amen. There are just some passages of Scripture that are encouraging. There are some that are, um, you know, they strike an intellectual chord. And then there are just some passages of Scripture that are just plain weird. And this has to be the weirdest. I mean, we've got a witch and a king and a ghost and a prophet, and this is like one of the strangest things. As a matter of fact, this looks more like an episode of Stranger Things than something coming from Scripture. The reality is we start to ask ourselves immediately, what would cause God's chosen king to take such an ungodly course? What would cause a king to go in such a dark place looking for answers? One who's supposed to represent God, represent his standards and his ways. Why is he searching for something in such a devil-driven place? The answer can be summed up in one word. It is the word rejection. You see, the backstory to this passage is is that um, King Saul was paired by God with an old prophet named Samuel. And they served as a one-two punch to lead the nation of Israel. Samuel represented the voice of God, and it was Saul as the king's job to execute the will of that voice in the, the nation. And they worked in tandem for many years doing a wonderful thing in leading people in godly ways. But over time, uh, Saul's heart began to fill with arrogance and pride. He started to, to look at himself as that he didn't need the voice of God anymore, and he started to stray from the things that the prophet would say to him. Well, it came to a head 
ahead in 1 Samuel chapter 15 that um, the prophet re- recognizes that Saul has just completely disregarded the instruction of the Lord. And so it just filled with holy anger, the old prophet comes to the battlefield where Saul and the, in, his army are camped. He goes in and he publicly chastises the king for his disobedience. He walks in and tells everyone that the king is no longer God's chosen king. And in a moment of true emotion, he literally rips the royal robes off of Saul. Now, though this was a godly declaration, it was done in a very rejecting way. And it wasn't just those robes that were ripped. Saul's heart was wounded from this mentor, this father figure, this person who was supposed to be cheering him on, instead throwing him out. And it's from that that a wound established of rejection in Saul's heart, and those words f- affected him deeply from that day forward. There's not a person here who hasn't felt that. Every single person here knows what it feels like to be rejected. For some of you, it was a teacher or a coach when you were young. For some, it was a friend or even an ex who you gave your, your full affection to, and they gave it back to you without treasuring it. For some of you, it came from, like Saul, some of the most meaningful people in your life, like your father, your mother, a grandfather, grandmother. The reality is, the question is not, have you been rejected? The question is, have you laid your rejection to rest? You see, um, Saul is going to a medium, a witch, because he is still haunted by the hurt that happened on that battlefield years ago. You see, though Samuel had died... The rejection lived on. And we can see it live on in in some symptoms in Saul's life that are just undeniable. The first one is, is that he is just completely insecure. Every time he walks out, he is crippled by the thought of what other people think about him. I wonder if a wound of rejection has caused some of you to feel that way when you walk into your office, your classroom, into a group of people that immediately your whole concern is how they perceive you. Additionally, Saul is also someone who is just completely inconsistent. One day he wants to rule the kingdom for God, and the next day he looks like he is doing completely ungodly things. And I think that inconsistency over time for many of us gives the same reality, that one day you want to change the world, and the next day you're not sure you even want to stay in it. And then the the ultimate thing for Saul is, is that this symptom of rejection is he's just inconsolable. I mean, he's had success, but it doesn't work. He, he's had substances, but they don't help. He, he's, he's acquired more fame and relationships, but he can't ever seem to finally find healing for the wound that happened on that battlefield all those days ago. And I think that many of you have been down the same path, that you've, you've tried to achieve your way out of this wound. You have tried to um, get affirmation from other people to heal this wound. You have done everything you can, but you seem to be inconsolable, living with this wound that is on the inside of rejection. Well, undoubtedly, when we live that long with a wound like that, what happens is is that we start going back and trying to fix it ourselves. And that is the reason Saul is at a witch that day. That he has decided that he's going to go back and dig in the past to hopefully find healing in the present. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. You probably aren't going to a Ouija board, but we do this all the time. We go back and read text messages to recount the conversation to see, is it in fact we missed something in what they said? We go back into our memories, digging far back in our memories, hoping there was a detail, there was a a, a mist, that something that was said or happened, we read it the wrong way, and that in that digging in our memories, we would find healing for today. We also go back and we retell the story to people again and again and again, hoping to get enough people on our side that somehow it quells the pain that is on the inside of us. Like Saul, we go back digging in old graves, hoping to find peace for the present. But as he is digging in old graves, looking for, the, the, uh, looking for something that will heal, he doesn't recognize that it actually digging in the past does great damage in the present. The first thing that it does is it undoes your identity. You see, you don't miss this note that Saul had to take off his royal robes in order to go digging in the grave of his past. 
that he couldn't walk in his royalty and insecurity at the exact same time. That the reason I bring that up for you and I is because 1 Peter 2, 9 says, we are a royal priesthood, a holy people, that God has set his crown of favor on our lives. But you know what I've learned? You can't walk in that authority and go digging in the old graves of your insecurity. That you and I will never find peace, that we have to take off the robe of righteousness to wear the robe of rejection in our lives. Additionally, we don't recognize that not only is it undoing our identity, but it's doing, taking us deeper into the enemy's plan. The Bible says that when, Saul, when Samuel shows up, this ghostly figure, he does not bring a message of peace. That he does not say, it's okay, Saul, you're right, let me apologize to you. Instead, he makes this announcement in verse 9. He says, tomorrow, because you have awakened me, you will join me in the grave. And here's what the Bible says. The next day on the battlefield, Saul lost his life and joined the old prophet in the grave. Now, here's what scholars tell us. That in fact, this is not the old prophet. Because an evil witch can't call forth people from God's eternal salvation. That instead, this is a masquerading spiritual enemy. A demon who's willing to show up looking like he's here to help, but instead his plan is to pull you deeper in the grave. Every time you and I suffer a wound of rejection, there's one guarantee, the voice of the enemy will show up. That he will show up to sow into our hearts and into our minds and into our souls lies. And for many of us, like Saul, we have been digging, digging, digging deeper into conversations and memories, and we think eventually we're going to get to the bottom, and it is going to allow us to heal. But what we don't realize is that the enemy's hand has gripped us, and that the deeper we go in the grave, the further he pulls us in, until before it's all said and done, like Saul, you're probably not going to lose your life, but you may stop living the life God called you to live. You know, I... I um, I started pastoring when I was in my early 20s, and um, I, uh, I'm convinced today that the enemy's first goal in my first two years was to uh, wound me with rejection to the point that either I would quit ministry or that I, my heart would just get so hard that God couldn't use me. And I'll never forget an email that I got from a leader who was in our church. I mean, someone who was, who was around the table. I mean, they, they were deep in them and their family. They asked for a meeting, and I was so naive. I just thought, oh, this is going to be good. We sat down together, and they said, well, Pastor, I'm going to jump straight to the, to the conclusion. You know, um, me and my family are resigning all our positions, and we're leaving the church. And I, I, I was shocked. I was stunned. I said, well, excuse me, what did somebody do? Did something, did something happen? How can I make this right? He said, well, you can't make it right. Because he said, you're the problem. He says, you're a nice guy and all, but at the end of the day, you just don't have what it takes to feed me and my family. He said, we're going to go down the street to another well-known big ministry, and that's where I think we're supposed to be. Now, in that moment, at first, I was angry because I, I, I had done a lot for this family. Next, I was just shocked because I thought this guy was on my team. But mostly, I was just in pain because what he thought about me is what I already thought about me, that I didn't have what it takes, and he became a reinforcing voice to my own self-rejection. That's interesting is that meeting ended but it's odd. That guy never stepped foot back in the building, but for the next few months, it's as though he never left. He never sat in another seat, yet I don't remember a service that he wasn't sitting right beside me. He never said another thing to me, yet I could hear his voice clearly as I was preaching. That he, he never met with me again, yet it felt like I never had a meeting that he didn't attend. I was haunted by that hurt. And here's how you know you really can, you get to a place where you're haunted by hurt. It's when it's so strong in your life, it infiltrates your prayer. Have you ever been praying something like going down an intentional list or, or topic, and then all of a sudden your mind just starts to swing to something that has nothing to do with what you've actually been praying about? I remember many times praying over the church, my family, over different situations. I would be praying with my mouth for what was on my heart or on, what was on a list but my mind would always stray back to that meeting that happened in my, my office. And one day, just out of God's mercy, I'm praying, and, and again, all of a sudden, my heart starts to go back to where rejection was. And it's, it, it, it happened so commonly, I didn't even recognize it anymore. And it was on this day that in an act of mercy, 
God, it's like he shouted on the inside. It's like he said, son, and it woke me up. And then I'll never forget what the Holy Spirit said. He said, if you don't let this die, it'll never let you live. And in that moment, I was awakened to this reality that we cannot spend our lives, I can't spend my life digging in the graves of a past rejection. That at some point, I have to cover up what has been opened up. That I have to allow a healing work of the Holy Spirit to take place in my heart and life. And here's what I discovered. That that there's a path to that healing. It's not all in one moment. There's a path to it. And and that God took me on that path. And today, I stand healed from that rejection. Able. And the reason I'm here today is because I sense the Holy Spirit sent me to Motor City Church to announce the same thing He did in me, He's going to do in each of you. That you don't have to live any longer in the grave of your past, but that God is going to do a work in your present where he's going to heal some things that have been open for way too long. You don't have to keep digging in memories and digging in all the things that were said, that there's going to be a new day for you, that you're not going to have open graves, but we're going to have a funeral today and put some things to rest so that you never return to that old place and you're able to fulfill the abundant life that God has for you in Jesus' name. Now, there's a specific, a specific pattern to do that. And so, so if you were taking notes today uh, here in, in, in Troy or in Louisville, today, right now, is where you take notes. There are four steps if you ever need to heal from a rejection. Um, and they're, in, they're so, so, you're not going to get these in a blog. They're, they're scriptural, and I want you to get them because if you're not living in a rejection, you're going to be at some point. You need these. Here's the first one. The first thing you're going to do is you have to learn, you have to enter God's presence. Um, years ago, I was traveling, speaking at a church, and it was on a Sunday, and I, as I was driving uh, back home, I, I just got this, like, this hunger for chicken. And, um, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I think, I think I want chicken on Sundays because God's favorite restaurant is Chick-fil-A. That's like, you know, it's like our modern-day manna. You know, the crazy thing is, is I only ever want Chick-fil-A on Sundays when it's not open. Isn't that the, the case? It works for you. So I remember, like, just kind of having this hunger for chicken, realizing Chick-fil-A isn't open. So I just decided to go to another place that is known for chicken. I mean, that's what they're known for, chicken. That's what they advertise as chicken. On on the sign, it says chicken. On the advertisements on the window, it says chicken. When you walk in, it's just a menu of chicken. So I'm standing at the counter, and I, I, a little kind of teenage girl sitting there. She has an attendant, and she said, what can I get you? And I said, I'll take a number one, a chicken sandwich. And she said, I'm sorry, we're out of chicken. I said, excuse me? She said, yeah, we're out of chicken. She said, we do have a fish sandwich if you're interested in that, though. I don't know exactly what happened in the supply chain that caused a chicken place not to have chicken, but I do, am reminded in that moment of this, that there's nothing worse than showing up to a place expecting to receive something only to find out that they don't actually have what you want. And the reason I bring that up is because our culture tells us when we live with emotional wounds that sex can heal, that fame can heal, that enough followers can heal, but turns out we've all tried it and they don't have any chicken. The only place that you and I can truly find healing is in the one who created our very soul. It's in God's presence that we find all we need. Joy is found in his presence. Clarity comes clear in his presence. Wisdom is given in his presence. His presence can give you what no pill, no accomplishment, no person can ever give you. It's in his presence that we actually find that he knows what we need, that we don't even understand it at times, but he is able to untangle hearts and show us where anger leads and where fear goes. He is able to, like a ball of string, lay it out so that a healing work can come and cut away way the strings that are holding us to the pain that we are. It is we find in his presence that it is what our soul's been longing for. Listen, you can accomplish some great things. You can go see some beautiful places. You can meet a lot of people, but you will never find your soul at rest until your soul finds God. Your soul is God smitten, God starved. It is searching for God because he's the one that created it. And so many people are trying to heal without the presence of God. You see, and and here's what happens. Psalm 28, 7 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. Now notice this. In him, my heart trusts. Here's what it tells me. That we, when we enter God's presence, our heart opens to be healed. Many of us, because we're not in God's presence, we're trying to heal a closed heart. You see, when I go into God's presence, I'm reminded I don't have to heal myself. That I have a God who does this. And, and, but I, I want to I help you understand this. The, the reason that Saul ended up dead instead of delivered is because he went to the presence of the enemy instead of the presence of his God. You see, see what we have to understand here today, this is the risk, is that, that one of God's attributes is he is omnipresent. 
It means he's everywhere at all times. You've never been anywhere that God's not. But just because you're in his presence doesn't mean you've entered his presence. This is the difference. This is how people can come to church. And, and two people can be on the same row, and one person leaves completely whole, and another person leaves completely bound. They were both in the presence of God, but only one of them entered the presence of God. And it, we enter the presence of God through our worship. Now, here's the problem, though. It's very difficult to worship when you're dealing with the wound of rejection. Because we tend to worship based on how we feel. But here's what Jesus said about worship. He said there's four ways to worship. He said all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Four ways. Most of us settle for the way we're comfortable with. Intellectuals, intellect. Expressors, express. Prayers, pray. Singers, sing. To enter God's presence, especially when you're wounded, here's what's required. You need to express something, not that you're comfortable with, but something you're uncomfortable with. That you need to stretch yourself. You say, well, I don't want to do that. I, that doesn't make me feel good. Well, news break. We're not here to worship ourselves. And what most people call worship is really self-adoration. The reality is it's called a sacrifice of praise because it doesn't feel good. And for some of you, the reason you keep coming to an amazing church, but yet you keep walking out in pain is because you haven't stretched yourself to express something. Therefore, you have not entered God's presence. For some of you, this is the prescription today. You need to raise your hands for the first time in worship. For some of you, you need to open your mouth and sing for the first time. For some of you, you need to let tears flow for the very first time. And it's as you stretch in the pain, in the discomfort, in the frustration, as you stretch, you enter the presence of the one who can actually heal you. Here's the second one. Um, you must then unmask and admit your hurt. I had a friend who knew I was preaching this message, and he said, man, he said, Dr. Dave should have brought you in in October. This would be a great Halloween message. And I said, yeah, I'm not worried about it. I said, church people are always wearing masks. I mean, you know, we show up and, how you doing? I'm good, blessed, and highly favored. You know, how's your week been? Oh, it couldn't have been any better. And you and your wife have fought the whole way to church. I mean, it just, thank God you came to church instead of the lawyer's office or this thing would have already been over with. At some point, you and I have to take off the mask. We have to admit we're hurt. See, for many of you, the holdup to your healing is just being honest about it. Now, let me just say, this was a key part of Saul's mistake. He put on a disguise expecting to heal. And you, know, you don't heal faking it. And I get why we do it, because a lot of times we don't even recognize what, what needs to be healed in us. Emotions are so complex, memories compound on each other, events take place that we don't even fully get it. And, and, and let me just say that, that for many of us, that's, that's kind of what your problem is. You don't even think you need this message, and you desperately need this message. I'll give you an example. In our, in our home, we have a basket of single socks. <laughs> let me tell you what happens. Two socks go into the washer, and then somehow between the washer and the dryer, which are only four inches apart, one of those socks is lost. I, I don't know if there's a dimension, a portal to another dimension. I don't know if someone's playing a cruel joke. But, but somewhere in that, what happens is, is my sock drawer gets empty and this basket gets full because we don't have a match. And that's what many of you are dealing with right now. You're dealing with anger, but you don't know what it matches to. You're dealing with sadness but you don't remember the event that it started. You're dealing with rejection, but it's been so many years, you don't even tie it to what really happened. And here, here's what we have to understand about God. He is very precise in his healing. As a matter of fact, when Jesus talked about um, forgiveness, do you know he never spoke about it in general terms? Here's how he spoke about it, in accounting. You know what you don't say to your accountant? Just ballpark it. No, you want to know exactly where every penny came in and every penny goes out. To heal, you got to know what happened so that you can move forward from it. And that is the reason that we oftentimes have to, to just take off the masks and we have to be honest. And, and, and in that honesty, as we're sharing our heart with the Lord, or, and I know this is tough, share it with someone trustworthy. 
we stumble upon the very thing that's keeping us in our condition. Let me just tell you, some, you're not angry. Something happened to you years ago that birthed that anger. And you need to deal with that event in order to subside that anger. You, you are not filled with anxiety. As a, that's not your DNA. There's a thing that happened. And until you address that moment, what was said, what took place, you'll never be free from it. Now, here, here, here's the tough part. That means you're going to have to sit with a pastor, a campus pastor, an elder, someone godly, someone trustworthy, not everybody. And you're going to have to say, can I talk something through with you? And, and, and listen, Saul was the most isolated leader in the entire scriptures. No significant relationships, therefore no path to heal. That's why we have opportunities for groups and gatherings and connection moments. Don't just be a Sunday, show up, get out as quick as possible. In this room are some people who could have a conversation that would allow you to truly bear your heart. And when you do, healing moves further in your soul. It's, good. it's a reality for, for, for us that one of the most exciting, most exciting moments for me as a pastor is when somebody comes up to me and says, Pastor, can I talk to you? I'm going to tell you something I've never told anyone. I get excited. I don't get nervous because here's what I know. Light's about to invade darkness. Grace is about to come in to pain. That mercy's about to find its way to sin. That someone is getting ready to be free because they've finally taken off the mask. Here's the third one. Um, after you recognize what it is, you must release your pain. Um, my kids, uh, you know, with five of them, we've had every bruise and bump there is. And here's what, what I've noticed, that um, one day Ellie, she, she hurt her elbow, and she came to me, and she's crying, and she's holding her elbow. She came to me and said, Daddy, help me, help me, help me. And I went to reach to touch her elbow, and immediately she pulled back. She said, no, no, no. I said, well, how am I supposed to help it if I can't touch it? She came to the right person. She just wouldn't release the pain. I wonder how many services you've come to the right place, but you just haven't released the pain. I wonder how many times you've been here and in the presence of the Lord could have been healed but have chosen not to because you haven't released. And, and, and I get it. Listen, nothing tests, nothing tests our trust like releasing our pain. You know the reason we keep pain is for this reason. We believe if we don't hold on to it, it didn't happen. So therefore we keep it. And we would never give it to anyone unless they understand. It's kind of like in surgery. You're not going to lay on the table until you trust the doctor. I remember somebody, you know, of course, with five kids, somebody said to me one time, they're like, hey, you know, the, the topic of a vasectomy has come up many times. And, and I remember a guy told me one time, they said, hey, you know, I know somebody who does them real cheap if you want to get that done. <laughs> real cheap. Listen, if I get a vasectomy, we're going to the Mayo Clinic. We're going to have a Harvard-certified graduate top of his class. I ain't getting on the table for a real cheap vasectomy. <laughs> Listen, as much as I know about pain, I can't take your pain. And as much as your friends love you, they can't take your pain. There's only one person who fully understands your pain. Jesus Christ was the most rejected individual that's ever lived on this planet. He was rejected by his earthly father before he even arrived. He was rejected by the king or governor of an, an entire generation was slaughtered because this man was so hated before he took his first breath. He was then rejected by his brothers and sisters. They called him crazy and said he should have been committed. In Nazareth, he was rejected. In Galilee, he was rejected. In Jerusalem, he was rejected. His mentors, religious leaders, business owners, everyone he came in contact with rejected him. His 12 closest friends who swore they'd never leave him, each rejected him in his greatest time of need. He sat for three years across a fire at night from a guy he knew would stab him in the back. And in a most painful moment of his entire life, he was rejected by soldiers who spit on him and humiliated him. He was even rejected by thieves that were sitting beside him. He, and all of that pales in comparison to the fact that his father, because of our sin on him, turned his back. No one's ever been rejected more than Jesus Christ, and that's the reason you can release your pain to him. Amen. Additionally, though, he's not just knows rejection generally. He knows your rejection. That literally... The Bible says he collected your tears, he heard the words that were said, and that he has record of every wrong that's been done against you. He's not just familiar with pain, it's your pain he knows. I wrote this in my journal one time. 
If you're looking for someone educated in pain, it's Jesus. He studied criticism at every level, traveled abroad, enduring false accusations. His undergrad is in betrayal. He minored in discrimination. He majored in injustice. His graduate degree is in humiliation with a specialty in heartbreak. And that is the reason you can release your pain. So what does that even mean? Here's what it means. You choose to go nowhere else to find comfort. Not to a bottle. Not to a position. Not to a person. Every time you sense the pain, you take it to Christ alone. And I realize for some of you, you're here today and you say, Pastor Joe, I'm, I'm hurting so bad that there's no... I'm not, I'm not hurting, I'm, I'm, I'm not carrying pain, I feel buried. In the 1800s, there was a, a small uh, scuffle in the medical community because they'd had a string of several people who'd been buried alive. A man named Count uh, Michael Carnicki was so gripped one time by hearing of a young girl who had been buried along. Obviously, they couldn't tell the difference between sometimes comas and the, the vital signs would go so low that he came up and patented, in the U.S. patent, a safety coffin. A safety coffin was nothing more than a coffin that had an airway that went to the surface and that had a string that if a person, in fact, woke up, they could pull the string and a bell would ring on the top. Now, this was, this was not a, uh, something that was widely used. Obviously, it, it wasn't massively needed. But it is U.S. patent, and, but it, the whole design was based on really one thing, and it was that the cemetery had to assign a watchman. No good to ring a bell if nobody hears. So a cemetery participating would basically hire a night watchman, someone who would walk among the freshly buried graves after the funerals were over and after the, the uh, families had gone. When everybody else had given up, this person's job was to walk among the dead, to listen for life. And if in fact they heard the bell ring, they immediately would go and uncover what had been buried. They would open up the coffin and they would pull the person back to the surface, back to life. I know some of you feel so buried with what happened. For some of you, it feels like the people who've meant the most to you have completely given up on you. As a matter of fact, statistically, people who've been through what you've been through, statistics say they don't recover. They don't live productive lives. They don't have peace. Some of the most precious people in your entire life may have completely given up on you. But Jesus Christ is not one of them. Even today, like a watchman, he listens for the faintest sign of life. For a heart that would say, take this pain. He rushes in a moment and uncovers the lies. And he pulls us back to abundant life. You don't have to dig yourself out. Christ will do that. You just have to release the pain. Now here's the very last one. And this is the one that's most important because it almost seems like we're done. But this fourth one is why so many people return to their pain you then receive God's blessing. You see, releasing your pain gets you out of the grave, but receiving God's blessing is what covers the grave so you never return. And a lot of people have received, released pain, but they've just never taken the time to receive who God says they are. As a matter of fact, let me say it this way. Saul, in 1 Samuel 10, what we read is 28. In 1 Samuel 10, here's the very first thing the Lord spoke over Saul. Before anyone knew who he was, the day he was chosen king, here's what the Lord said. You are a new person by my spirit. You will have gifts you did not have before. Go and do whatever you see fit. I will be with you. Before he ever was king, God declared his approval over Saul. This is the tragedy of Saul. He spent his entire life trying to find something he always had. And so many people spend their entire lives trying to find approval from their heavenly father they've always had. I know some of you just can't imagine that with the situation you got going on, but I have a friend of mine, a friend of Dr. Dave's, named Scott. Scott's dad's name's Robert. When Scott was a junior in high school, he was playing baseball, and they were at a doubleheader. Scott's team was down by one run, 
and it was the bottom of the ninth. There were two outs against Scott's team, and he had two people on base, and Scott came up with a chance to win the game. Um, Scott came up. It's a very tense moment. The pitcher rears back, releases a fastball. Scott takes the biggest swing he can. He connects and hits a game-winning double. It's one of the best moments of his entire life. The stands are going wild. The team is chanting his name and meets him when he walks off the field. The other team walks away in disgust at their loss. Scott is literally the hero. Second game comes up, and strangely, in this doubleheader, the second game almost occurs exactly as the first. It's a back-and-forth um, affair until it gets to the bottom of the ninth. Scott's team is down by one run, and there are two outs. And, and almost a, a, just a way that you couldn't predict, Scott comes up again with a chance to win the game. He walks up with a ton of confidence. After all, he just did this. The, the, the stands are buzzing, thinking this is going to happen again. Scott walks up. The pitcher rears back, releases that same fastball, but this time it goes right past Scott. Strike one. Scott gets ready. Second pitch is released. Scott takes a big swing, fouls it off. Strike two. Pitcher rears back for the third throw, releases it. Scott sees it. It's a little outside. He lets it go back by expecting it to be a ball. The umpire, next thing he hears is, Steve Wright, ball game. Game's over. Scott has watched the final strike go by. His team's not chanting his name anymore. They're all groaning. The stands, all the energy's been deflated. The other team's celebrating, and Scott now feels the weight of letting down everybody. With his head down, staring at the plate, feeling his failure, he hears something. Over his shoulder, he hears, that's my boy. That's my boy. That one right there. That's my boy. He looks back and his dad is cheering at the top of his lungs in the same way he was when Scott had won the game a game before. He comes down on the field, wraps his arms around Scott, tears welled in Scott's eyes, and he says, Son, a strikeout cannot change your DNA. You're mine. I'm saying to you that in the middle of this divorce, in the middle of this failure, in the middle of the fact you got fired, in the middle of this addiction, you think God wants nothing to do with you, but if you could hear over the balcony of heaven today, you would hear him say, you see that one? She's my daughter. You see him? That's my boy. The one in the divorce? That one's mine. The one in the addiction? That one's mine. That you're approved of, not because of what you've done, but because God in his goodness loves you so much that he is able to see past your worst moments and to the very DNA that you are his. And when you get that, you don't want to go back to any graves. I want you to stand to your feet. I want you to stand to your feet, Louisville, right now. I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes. This is a very important moment as many people, this has dug up some really, really serious stuff in hearts and minds today. Two responses very quickly. First and foremost, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you are not in a relationship with Jesus Christ, you say, what does that mean? It means he, he you know, it doesn't mean you don't, you're against him. It doesn't mean you dislike him. It just means you are not following him. He's not the one that decides your actions, your steps, your directions. You have just not surrendered your life to him. There is no healing without first making Jesus Lord. And so what I want to do today, if first and foremost, if you're here today and you say, Pastor Joe, I want, today's my day. I'm choosing to follow Jesus. I'm choosing. I'm making that decision, whether in Louisville or here in Troy. If that's the day, I, I, I want to pray for you. But I, I don't want to do just a blanket thing. I want to pray for you. Face. I'm not going to embarrass you, but a face with this prayer. So if you're here today and you say, Pastor Joe, today I'm choosing to follow Jesus. I'm surrendering my life. Would you just raise your hand? Just raise your hand. Come on. Just right now. I see a hand here and I see, see one over here. People there in Louisville, we're looking right now. We see. Yep. Raise your hand. Okay. All right. Now here's the second, second one. If you're here today and you would say, Pastor Joe, I am a follower of Jesus, but I need to be healed. Not, not just in my body. I'm talking about I need my emotions healed. Today has stirred up so much, and I'm desperate to be healed by the Lord Jesus today. I, 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 for some of you, I even believe that this, this just seems all that eerie because this has been on your mind recently. 
You've had a little bit of a slowdown this week because of, of, of just the, the July 4th and you find your mind going back to old pains. If that's you, I want to pray for you, but I'm going to ask you to take a step of faith. Would you just shoot your hand up so I know who I'm praying for? Pastor Joe, pray for me today. I want to heal today. I want to heal. Come on, real high, real high, all over the room, all over the room, all over the room. Come on, Louisville, Louisville, I want you to raise your hand. It, it, I, I want you to raise your hand right now. Yep, yep, yep. All right, here we go. I want you to open your hands just like this as to holding on to nothing. And I'm going to pray for you. And when I say amen, I want you to tell the Lord Jesus, this is yours. I'm giving you this pain. I want you to release it to him. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now. I pray that every lie of the enemy would be undone by your word. I pray every wound of rejection would be mended by your spirit. And I pray that every chain pulling people into the grave of the enemy's plan would be undone. It would be buried, set at rest, and they would be free to live the abundant life. Father, I'm praying that you turn this into an operating room. You heal bodies, but you also heal memories. You heal traumas and triggers. And so may right now a deep, deep work, a mending of broken hearts be released. And Father, may the love of God be made true in every heart. May they receive the blessing of heaven today. A supernatural realization, not something just in their head, something in their heart that says, I'm a son or daughter of God and my failures do not change DNA. May a supernatural healing take place in Jesus' name. Now, right now, I want, you to, I want you to take just a moment as we go back into worship, and I want you to literally release that. Release it right now. I release what they said to me. I release being let go. I release being mistreated. I release this. I release it. Whatever it is, I want you to put some words to it as a step of faith today. I hope today's message was an encouragement to you. And if it was, please take just a minute, like this video, uh, hit the subscribe button so that every time we bring out a new life-giving message, you will be the first to know. We'd love to hear from you. Put a comment in there and share. Why not share this great message of hope with someone else? We look forward to connecting with you more. And please visit MotorCityChurch.org. We'll see you next week.